It's May, it's hot, it's the Munich High End Show 2023. Let's take a stroll inside and see what they've got us. Welcome to Convince Me Audio. Munich High End Show 2023. We're here with the Sennheiser booth. How's it going? Amazing, thanks so much. How's Absolute your day so far? pleasure. <laughs> HU1 at last after a decade of just hunting this beast down. Shall we have a listen and see what it's like? Of course. Beautiful. So these are the headphones themselves. They got a little bit of a weight behind it. Pads are very, very comfortable. Leather, right? Uh, yeah. 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 Let's see what the comfort's like. Very comfortable, obviously not isolating as you can imagine. Uh, completely open back. Sits inside the unit itself. Everything closes up nicely. Shall we play some Hans Zimmer? Yes. And see how we get on. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah, there we go. Before I give my impressions, tell me a bit about its history. Okay, uh, I, I guess I have to start a while back. So it was, uh, the, there was a successor once in 1991, the old Orpheus, as we call it. Yes. Uh, and that has also back history that in, 80, uh, in 1988, actually, the, um, the old management of Sennheiser was walking around the um, um, affair in Berlin. Um, and, and there AKG was presenting a new headphone. It was like AKG K1000. Okay. And they had a lot of pride about being the best uh, headphone manufacturer. And then they listened to the AKG headphone and they were so impressed. And, and they went immediately back to the engineers and said, now build the best you can do, no, cost no object. And first the engineers thought it was a joke because cost is always an object. Yeah. And after a month, uh, the CEO back then, Fritz Sennheiser, came back and asked, well, what's your progress? And then they only realized, okay, we actually have to start working on it. And um, then not they, just a conception. Actually, do the job. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and then they really went back to the basics. And uh, there, there's a lot of really physicists and scientists at the company that really don't care whether it's a microphone or a headphone. They really care about the foundational of the acoustics, and uh, and are really able to let's say find the best compromise between the different aspects of of a headphone. And they quickly realized for the best sound reproduction, electrostatic headphones are the best because the transducers are the lightest. So the idea is the heavier a transducer is, is the, the slower it is to follow very intricate movements of the music. And of course, a voice coil in a dynamic headphone is very, very heavy. And so it cannot be ideal. And the electrostatic headphone has really just a small foil of like two micrometers thickness. So it is really the lightest you can get. There's yeah. nothing attached to it. And the, the main constraint then with electrostatic headphones is a so-called stator. So there are sheets of metal on either side of the diaphragm. Yeah. And, um, or it can be also different material. And the balance is to find something that is extremely stiff, because if it's not, not stiff, then it will move with the diaphragm yeah. together. And then you have distortion, because that movement is not generated to the diaphragm alone. Yeah. So you want minimum distortion, so it needs to be as stiff as possible. And on the other hand, it needs to be as open as possible. So you need a lot of holes in there, perforations, so that air can freely fl uh, flow through it. Yes. And if it's very, very, um, for instance, the state is very, very thick, and you have very few holes in it, then you have a lot of resistance towards high frequency extensions, for instance. So the Office was the first headphone that really uh, incorporated really years of, of research where they tried out different thicknesses, different perforations, and really find the ideal compromise between openness, uh, really the, the uh, stiffness of the material, to really create something that sounds very, very open and spacious, and with very good high frequency extension, and something that has as little distortion as possible. And the dampening, the way it's done, and for the bass response, is actually 
freaking remarkable yes. um, for an electrostatic because they normally yeah. roll off quickly, don't they? Yeah. This, which I will get onto in a minute and talk about the sound response and characteristics, um, was actually what really surprised me. Mm -hmm. The way it extends and how low it goes and how impactful it is. It's it's quite it's quite an achievement. I mean, this yeah. is a very noisy environment right now, yeah. and you're not missing too much. So with that, let me give you guys a quick highlight of how this thing sounds. As you guys know, so on the channel, we just did the Brevera review and I've got the Aperio in. So we are kind of dealing with some of the highest end electrostatic systems that's available to us. And um, throwing the Shang Senior from Hi Fireman into the mix, sitting here listening to the HE1, the impact from the HE1 if I can uh, bring it round to new kind of the headphones that all of us usually actually play with on the table, has like an LCD5 sort of visceral impact, a caldera impact, and yet the speed and transparency and resolution of an electrostatic that we're basically stepping away, way, way away from X9000, Sasvara's, LCD5, and those kinds of headphones that we usually review. It's kind of all-encompassing. The, the detail retrieval is absolutely off the charts as to be expected, but what really is making it sound like a completely rounded out headphone is the fact that you've got full extension and full bass response digging low to the sub bass. We were just listening to the Hans Zimmer track, Pirates of the Caribbean, live, one of my test tracks, and yeah, I think it's definitely the best rendition of that track I've heard. 50 instruments on stage, nothing missed. Even in an environment like this, I could follow every instrument. It's out of this world. If you're at Can Jam, if you're at Munich Iron Show next year, come to Sennheiser, you need to check this out. Even just to listen to, to broaden your horizons, this needs to be heard. And obviously, as you can imagine, in a studio environment, in a quiet environment, I'm sure this thing will just blow the ceiling off the house. This is insane. Thank you so much for your help. Thank you, you so much. much. And we'll have a little bit more of a listen and I'm going to leave you. So the HE1s, this is my third listen now. So I feel as though I've spent some time with it. Um, and obviously with the Aperio and Shang Senior, everything's like in my head now. So I can actually give you guys a good first impressions of how this headphone is actually performing. First of all, without a doubt, it's up there. So we've got the HE1, we've got the Shang Senior, and we've got Aperio fighting for the top spot of performance. But as an all built system, as this is designed to be kind of run by itself on a nice coffee table like this, this system is very, very articulate not only in its kind of form but in its, fun and its functionality but in its sound. I was just listening to Michael Jackson's Billie Jean. I've heard this track thousands upon thousands of times by up to now, like over the last 25 years. And starting with a low end, it's hefty. Every kick of the kick drum seems to concave your eardrums through the back of your head. It's actually surprising how utterly weighty this electrostatic is and normally that's where the problem is with these systems they are lacking in low end most of the time so in terms of base levels i would go shank senior at the lowest aperio next and he1 at the top it gives the lcd5 sort of i'm going to kick your eardrums in Obviously, detail retrieval is absolutely insane. Um, probably unmatched, but I would like to have it side by side with Shang Senior to see in a quiet environment. Um, it's quite noisy, people are beginning to come in here now. Vocal presentation, tonal balance is just amazing. The stage is intimate, too good. So you've got the central point of the singer here but its depth information is absolutely off the charts. It's fantastic. When you first switch it on, it takes a while for those tubes to warm up. This is sounding slightly different from yesterday. So yesterday it was warmer. It was as if there was fire infused with the track. 
When I heard it for the very first time, opening the lid and you just take it out, like normal tubes, I think it requires a little warm up time. So it was a little bit more cooler present. There was a slight sharpness around six kilohertz, but that usually completely dissipates within like 20, 30 minutes of being left on. Because yesterday, compared to today, that beautification of the track was a little bit more on the neutral side today. Go into textural information for drum skins, for vocals, you get everything. It's one of those headphones, there isn't really a weakness to speak of, unless you specifically are looking for something that is beyond a reference, as it were. Is there anything that I would like to change about this system if I was actually tailing it to my taste? No, I think I would be content. In resolution, in detail retrieval, in timbral information, in speed. For classical music, I think I might like a little more stage. This is where the Shangri-La Senior has got a bit more height up there. Aperio has a bit more width, but I think HE1 has the better depth out of both of those together. So these three top of the line systems of the world are literally fighting and vibing for the attention. So at the DCS booth, uh, the stack. So we've got the amplifier, the clock and the DAC, like we looked at at Canjam London. Not much has changed from my impression since that point. It's sweet as honey. It's a wonderful presentation. I'm actually just listening to Hans in my live, which we had to listen to on the HE1 and the Aperio and Chang Senior as well. It's, it's a captivating sound. For me, it reminds me a lot of the Holo Serene, that sort of liquid glass sound signature. And just that basically thunder poured over honey is the best way I can put it. And I'm not familiar with these Yamaha headphones. I've tried them for the very first time today. And the synergy between this and the Bartok over there is just amazing. I heard that these headphones have a little forwardness in the treble, but synergy wise, it seems to be working very well with this system and the articulation of layering, the stage, the separation, the tonal balance uh, is just lovely. Absolutely fantastic on this unit. Engaging and disengaging the clock does make a big difference. You can definitely tell, and it's not one of those things you have to analytically listen for. It literally is just popping up. The, the way we do with something like the uh, M-Scaler from Chord on the Dave, you instantly do hear a difference. And uh, hopefully we can get a system like this on the desk and do a full analysis. But at the show, honestly, if you are at Munich or if you do go to the next show, come to the DCS booth and have a listen. It's, it's absolutely amazing. I really would like to hear the 1266 on this again. Hi James, how's it going? Yeah, very well, thank Absolute you. Absolute pleasure. You? Not too bad. How how's the show been? Yeah, really good this year. It's been uh, attendance has been really really good. Um, I think as we're sort of moving out of uh, of COVID times, more people are willing to travel internationally. So we've seen a lot more people coming in from Asia and the States. So it's been yeah really really well attended so far. It's been good fun. Beautiful. So what did you guys bring apart from everything? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are. We've got a lot of kit around the show. Um, in the Headfire booth here, we have got. First of all, the DCS Lena system. Yes. Uh, so this we released a little bit after Munich last year. Yeah. So this comprises of the network DAC on the top. Uh, in the middle, we have the master clock. And then on the bottom, the Lena headphone amplifier. This has a streamer. Um, yes, absolutely. Oh, okay, yeah. I didn't realize that. Okay, fantastic. Yep. Yeah, so we're using the same streaming technology in here as we are with the rest of our range. Um, so we've got Spotify Connect, Tidal Connect, um, Cobuzz, Deezer, Rune Ready, Airplay, if that's your thing, all sorts built in. Beautiful. Um, tell me a bit about the lineup in regards to the Bartok and then the Linus stack, etc. where and who you're targeting these at. Yeah, okay. Because that's the combo, right? The Bartok over there. That was the first time I actually saw it myself over yes, there. So. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we've, we've got some Bartoks here as well. Yeah. Um, it depends what you're looking to use the system for, really. So right. in terms of as a DAC, straight digital to analog converter, mm -hmm. the Bartok is the higher performing unit, especially with the Apex upgrade. Okay. Um, whereas if you're looking at it from a headphone amplifier perspective, mm -hmm. the Lena headphone amplifier is a little bit more capable than what we'll find inside the, uh, inside the Bartok headphone DAC. Interesting, um, okay. 
but again, really it depends what kind of headphones you're looking to drive with it. Yeah. So the Bartok is a beautiful Class A headphone output, mm -hmm. uh, but if you're driving some of the more demanding end of, let's say, the Planar Magnetic headphones, uh, things like the 1266 yeah, or the Susvara, Susvara, yeah. exactly, yeah, then uh, the extra drive capability of the Lena Amplifier definitely helps out there. Fantastic. What's the, out what's the power output of the Power Amp? Uh, so worst case, we're looking at 4.5 watts per channel. Okay. Um, so for Susvaras, it'll drive those to 120 decibels, completely clean and unclipped. Beautiful. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate your no time. Not at all. Thanks very Excellent. much for stopping Pleasure. by. Thank you. Pleasure. Hi. Right, so at the Audazy booth with their new headphones. Can you tell us a bit about this? Yeah, so that's our new MM100. Just announced, it should start shipping in a month or so. It's our entry-level pro headphone. It's in Germany, it's about 500 euros. In the US, it's uh, 399. And it's got our famous planar magnetic drivers. We sort of repurposed the headband from our Maxwell gaming headset. So we can save some cost on that. And uh, it's essentially a slimmed down version of the MM500 that we released last year. Yes. So I just had a quick listen to this and sounds very open. Actually, surprising, so I, I wasn't expecting this to be under $1,000. Obviously, showroom floor environment, take it with a pinch of salt, but it sounded very open. It, it felt as though like you were looking down a balcony and you can literally see right to the bottom of the mix. Slight forwardness in the treble region, but obviously, the, I don't know if that's the amp, the track, so it's very difficult to tell, but lush mid-range, very neutral sounding, I actually want more time with this. So hopefully we can bring one back to the studio and have a full in-depth review at that point in time. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Our pleasure. Glad you could come by. So we're at the Spirit Torino booth. Um, this time around, they've bought a new planar headphone and the technology behind it is quite interesting. We're going to get, speak to one of their engineers in a minute in regards to the actual design of this because what they've tried to do is how a dynamic headphone performs and how it's dampened and tuned, they've tried to bring that across to a planar headphone. I had a quick listen yesterday and it was quite captivating but it was quite loud so I'm going to go inside in the listening room in a minute and actually have another proper listen and see how this has come across. And uh, it's a very interesting idea of what they've done. But for me, it's the Spirit Torino Valkyria that is something that's holding my attention. A dynamic headphone, this is cruising around the $12,000 category. Um, at the moment, it's in the studio, so it's under the review process, but it's quite captivating. It's quite an interesting headphone. And we'll have a quick listen to that again while we're here at the Munich High End Show. So with that, hi, how's hi. it going? Good, so, how are you? Not too bad. Tell us a bit about everything you guys bought here for the show and how the show has been going. How has the reception been for you guys? Yes, it's been wonderful. It's been lovely to see people that already heard about us and are excited to try the headphones in person for the first time. So that's always very reassuring as a business that's uh, only started a few years ago. Um, so it's been really exciting to see people's reactions to the headphones, how they've been appreciating the sound quality. And uh, I'm a musician myself, so I really appreciate when I can get the sensation of almost like a live music experience in a headphone, uh, that's incredible to me. So this, Andrea is the genius behind it, the man who designed all the headphones himself. Yeah. Um, this one is the latest model, the Chintauri that he created, and it's our only planner headphone, our first one. Uh, the rest are dynamic, and uh, yeah, it's just been wonderful to see people appreciate the craftsmanship and the quality. Fantastic. Um, How much does this one sit in price-wise? So this one is in the 2800 Oh, so uh, range. way, 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 yes. way under someone. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, okay. so this one is definitely, uh, it's been a, like the most popular one uh, recently because it's still very like high end, uh, but a bit, yeah, in the it's price range. It's approachable the yeah, price wise. Yeah, more approachable yeah. price range. It's also great for professional use as well. If somebody is a music producer, mixing engineer, uh, there's that option as well, uh, because actually you can see, you can adjust the bass level on the headphone so this is detachable and then okay, what, I didn't an, see that yesterday. what Andrea That's has done is he's created a little hole where you can actually move the headphone 
and adjust how much pressure you like on your ear and uh, that affects the bass. Okay, as well. I'll definitely try um, that out in so a second. Yeah, definitely. It's Fantastic. A, it's really incredible work. Like I said, I'm only a musician, but I can really appreciate what he's done uh, for the acoustic experience. Excellent. Uh, Thank you so, so much. Yeah. Uh, we'll, go and have, we'll go inside and have a quick listen. So these are the headphones themselves, uh, planar obviously. Uh, they've got really interesting tuning. It's uh, some elevation in the mid bass, but you can actually fine tune these by, these are magnetically uh, attached. You got like an opening here behind the driver that closes and opens as you rotate the pads. And just so that you always know where it is, there is a groove that where the pads actually sit in place and sit still where it's basically the baseline, where it's completely open, the baffle like at the back is completely open. Price-wise, this is priced a lot cheaper than like their other headphones and things, but this is interesting. It's got really interesting like liquid tuning, touch of warmth, but I think um, when I heard it yesterday, it was slightly different on a different equipment. So it looks like uh, it changes quite drastically with source and stuff. Um, it'd be interesting to bring one of these in-house for an actual review. Interesting, uh, very, very, very different from the Valkyria, obviously. Uh, I think they, a bit, they are a bit more genre non-exclusive, the way Valkyria is. Like, Valkyria requires real instruments really to shine. Electronic music is hit and miss. But this seems to be definitely more of an all-round genre sort of uh, scenario. We've got a completely round pad. Doesn't seem to be any comfort issues either. Tiny bit of weight to it. Uh, I would say this is probably as heavy as like a caldera or something. Uh, interesting design. Very, very interesting. So Andrea wanted to also mention that we've tried to create a planner headphone that doesn't actually uh, sorry, let me do that one again. That can non suona planar. Che non suona da planare. Che non suona da planare. E che suona da. Okay. <laughs> so uh, he wanted to mention that he's created a planner headphone that does not play like a planner headphone. The problem with a lot of planner headphones is that they don't have a lot of dynamic because the sheet doesn't move. That yes. can't move very much. Um, very limited, yes. Yeah. So he instead has created a design where even though it's planner, there is still some flexibility. So he's actually created a new material uh, that's a composite uh, textile wood, uh, which is the drive holder. Okay. And that helps to create a little bit more flexibility um, in the design. Fuori di ventilazione me lo devo fare. Ah, okay. It's a very light material but also quite strong, yeah. and it allows to include some uh, ventilation pads. Okay. So that's why it's, uh, yeah. Oh, a fantastic. flexible and dynamic as an yeah. experience. And uh, if you guys want more information in regards to the tech behind this, I'll put it in the description from the website and stuff as well. This unit is actually available now? Is it launched? Uh, yeah, Has it launched already? Yeah, it's already launched at Centauri. So it's only two months that we've launched it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's brand new. Fantastic. Uh, I'll try and get yeah. one in for a review as much as I can. Thank you so much for your help. Oh, it's you're been very wonderful. Welcome. Fantastic. So nice to meet you. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> So, over here at the ZMF booth for the very first time, meeting Zach, meeting Bev, and having a quick listen to the Calderas. This I just literally reviewed, I think it was last week, not being released yet. This is a fantastic headphone. Uh, the first planar for Zach and for ZMF. It kicks like a mule. It's got the beautiful ZMF house sound mid-range and genuinely, you can not have any problems synergy-wise with any equipment, honestly. If any genres, this is fantastic. Also spent some time with the O Tours as well for the very first time ever. And I think we've finally done all of Zach's headphones now. The O Tour will definitely be coming in for a full review. Um, I was kind of enamored by it, to be honest with you. And uh, yeah, let's have a chat to Zach and see their new headphone. They've just released the Atrium Closed as well. Hi, Zach. Pleasure Georgie. meeting you for the very first right, time. First time. Yeah. First it's time, long time. Definitely. We've been chatting yeah. so long as well. <laughs> yeah. 
So, yeah. what did you bring for us? And uh, obviously talk to me a little bit about your latest release as well, the Atrium Closed. Yeah, I mean, uh, we've been busy in the last year and the Atrium's kind of a new model within the last year. So we came out with the Atrium Open back last April and the uh, Atrium Damping System. Yeah. Uh, you know, which has really helped us get that soundstage with the warmth, you know, that three-dimensional nature that I think a lot of people enjoy, but still get that blown out stage a little bit. Um, and then we continued with that about a year later, where we now have the, uh, the Atrium Closed model that uses the same similar damping system, uh, but we were able to get the caldera pads on this Atrium Closed model that gives it that kind of more diffuse nature to get a really open sound. And yeah. then it also comes with the suede pads and the leather pads, so you can get you know a little bit of each world. Are you a suede, suede. or a leather? You're Definitely a suede, suede guy. Pad, yes. And a little more, a little closer to Harman tuning with the yeah. suede, where you get the uh, slightly warmer sound, a little more punchy, bombastic sound. That's it. It's uh, surprisingly, it's about 50-50 so far. What people prefer, I, I unabashedly like the the very warm. Uh, le lambskin sound, but the suede's good on a nice tube amp, I would say. I'm thinking like the leather pads require a little more break-in time than kind of what I've been testing it with. I'm curious what will happen, like say, after a few months of that leather breaking in properly. Yeah. Uh, but the suede, I got the sound I wanted right off the bat. And the amazing thing was there was actually no resonances in the cup. That was something that really surprised me. That it really just delivers a sound without there being that kind of peaks in resonances, usually in like the mid bass or the below the mid bass, just about encroaching on the sub bass category. It just dissipates beautifully. It's, it's really nicely done. Yeah, that, that was important to me to get that kind of closed back wide sound, but not use as much cup reverb as maybe in our early models like the Atticus and Icon. Yeah. And oh, I, those I think two I've not heard thing. you either. Um, we'll have to we'll have to figure that out then. Get you the whole. You have just, whole just, ZMF, just put a the wheel on the ZMF. ZMF. Yeah, <laughs> convince me. Audio ZMF month. Yeah, it'll be uh, all the classics. Definitely. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, they, so the atrium closed with the other thing, and then the other thing we have is that what you're holding right now, which is that uh, the Caldera, which is our first planar magnetic headphone. Oh yes. And we went, you know, what I always find it easier to do the flagship, the you know, the very you know best thing first and then use the trickle down technology to go back through the lineup. So we, we plan on expanding our lineup in planar magnetics in the years to come. Oh I hope so. Uh, but this is our definitely our flagship um, which will be here for some time and uh, you know also has the atrium damping system but took me, you know, we actually started I actually started designing the planar driver in this all the way back when I stopped doing the T50s. Are you serious? There were some long? modifications that I did to the T50s to kind of open up the magnets in the front, okay. which was kind of part of how we got the T50s to sound how they did. Yeah. And I knew I wanted to do it in a proprietary driver, but uh, you know, the journey to getting a planar driver to sound really good, be made consistently, and all the things, what coatings go on it, what thickness is the membrane gonna be, the shape of the magnets, finding someone to make the magnets. It just, it took a long time and also, I didn't want to make something that was uh, redundant in the market, so yeah. it was just important to me to, to make sure that it could also have that dynamic ZMF sound. I, you know, so it's a whole new system, but ended up being, you know, very. You're basically, ZMF. starting again from scratch. You know, yeah. on the different. Uh, this cup is beautiful, mate. Genuine. <laughs> yes, uh, the Red Heart Limited. Uh, you know, the, we we like the kind of bold red colors. They they oh, definitely stand God. out. This and, is just stunning. <laughs> yeah, it gives you a little. It's Brilliant. a work of art, I must admit, genuinely. So beautiful. Thank you so much, Zach. I'm gonna shoot off to the next booth, but it's been an absolute pleasure. It's, it's my pleasure, so sir. Yes, keep, keep on so convincing much. that audio. Thank you so much, mate. Say. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you, bye. So, at the Royal booth, CA1A, I'm actually reviewing this unit right now back at the studio, but behind me that gentleman's using the ear speaker. That from last year has just been on my mind. It was kind of really captivating. And uh, Danny's uh, helping the gentleman at the moment, but we'll have a chat with him in a minute in regards to the philosophy behind that. But the CA1A, this unit is pretty fantastic. It comes with its own transformer box that you'll add on to another amplifier and uh, basically using tube amplifiers, solid state amplifiers. It's been a very good performer, but we'll get onto that in the review properly. 
By the way, this is very comfortable. This will be... Yes. I think it's about $2,000 with the Energizer box about $2,500. So in the category of like the ZMF headphones of uh, pricing and stuff. Interesting technology behind this and they're very, very comfortable. But once that gentleman leaves, we'll go and have a listen to the ear speaker. So we're back at the Raoul booth. After Can Jam London, Danny, absolute pleasure again, absolute mate. Absolute pleasure, my friend. Good to see you. Likewise, but so the last time I was enamored by these ear speakers, literally their comfort and they don't impeach your ears or anything like that was really, really kind of interesting to me. And hearing it again, I realized my mind didn't over exaggerate anything. Honestly, I can't wait to review this unit. This is, this is fun. This is a great deal of fun. They punch quite hard. I'm really surprised for something that doesn't enclose your ears at all. Liquid sound. And I want to see how much the amp is actually affecting the synergy with this unit. It's basically using the oh, same wow. um, energizer box as a CA18. So you can use one Good for both. Great. Tell us a little bit about this uh, headphone. Oh, oh, information? Yes. OK, this is a um, ribbon headphone and it is an open baffle headphone. Mm -hmm. So you don't have the usual uh, circumaural pads going all the way around it. It's a dipole, it's free open air. Yeah. Uh, extremely light element. One of the great features with the ribbon is it's extremely light, very uh, responsive. And it doesn't have uh, drum modes like a typical uh, speaker would. Yes. Uh, a typical speaker being attached on four, uh, all, all sides, all the way around. Think of like a timpani drum. Yeah. And you get what are called drum modes. With the ribbon, there are no drum modes because it's only attached to two points, the yes. top and the bottom. So it's more like a guitar string. Yes. It just flaps there. You know, it's being uh, excited by the uh, audio coming into it. Yeah. And uh, because of that and the open nature of it, it's an extremely natural sound. Tonally, it's so correct. It's, it's lovely. I'm yeah. genuinely enjoying this. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing to get in the way. You know, we don't mess with it. It's, yeah. it's just the diaphragm doing what it, the music tells it to do. And by bringing these closer and opening them up, opens the stage more, seems to throw a sound out a lot more in front of you, but obviously experimentation in a quiet environment is necessary for that. Yes. It's been fantastic. I can't wait to review it genuinely. Very excited. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time, mate. I really do appreciate Always it. Always a pleasure, Thank brother. you so much, mate. Thank Cheers. you. Munich High End Show. Hi, how's it going? Oh, fantastic. So how, how have you been finding the show? Busy? Extremely busy. We're very lucky. We're very fortunate. You know, Munich, rock that's, and roll. That's fantastic. So talk to us about the products on the table. What have you bought us and what do you want to talk about as well? Yeah. First of all, thank you for coming here to Germany. The High End Show. Thank you we so brought, much. Particularly to the High End Show, we brought a Signature Pure, okay. which we think is on our signature line. And Michael, our CEO, will tell you something about the history of the signature line and I go on to talk about the product. Michael. Thank you so much, oh, Robert. Yeah. Signature actually has a long, long history. Uh, the base was uh, founded in 2004 with the famous edition 7, which was then um, followed by the edition 9. And people said to us, couldn't you do a signature or a professional product out of that? Because we love the sound, it's the best sound around. We must have a product without any shiny aspects, but just for professional use. Yeah. And that was the, the point where we created Signature Pro around about 10 years ago. As the fan base grow around the world, actually, we, we had just come back from Tokyo High End Show. We had the task for our community to actually bring a value proposition to something very affordable. Yeah. So Michael and myself worked very hard and my experience of running other headphone companies, we achieved to bring the cost down to something which hasn't been seen at Ultrasound. So retailing these things at 169 has an amazing value. What we did, we got engaged with our community and our community suggested a retail price which is affordable to them. So as we want to get people in love, love with music and able to play an instrument, we brought this price point down to 169. We tried uh, three 
three editions, the day before yesterday, right? When I came here to... Yeah. Uh, so talk to me about the categories, uh, the three separate uh, variations of that tuning we tried. Yesterday we, we tried actually the new, the new signature line, the signature line 2023. Yeah. And the new lineup is basically signature pure, 50 millimeter driver, signature fusion, 45 millimeter driver, and then the signature master MK2 is a 40 millimeter titanium compound driver. Yeah. That's what we listened yesterday. And everything what you find, it starts off with uh, you have a 50 millimeter driver with a 25 millimeter ear cushion, which gives you a very wide sound state with a deep bass, but not too booming. Yes. You're going down. The fusion of the project, or basically pure and master, is the fusion, and the fusion has more detail in highs and mids. Yep. And then you go up to the flagship, which we're using, or many professionals are using it for mastering and mixing, is the 40 millimeter driver. Okay. How much is the your flagship uh, headphones, if we're talking about um, pricing? The signature piece, basically, the, the, yeah, the top of the line. The top of the line, as I said, it ranges up. You know, we have, in the signature series, we used to retail 999, uh -huh. and I think what we achieved is a price point of 699, and we're going down. That's all, amazing, yeah. All the way down now to 169. 169 yes. In the middle, we haven't actually not set the pricing yet, but I guess it will be around 400. Yes, fantastic. So this sounds like a very exciting lineup of headphones and we're going to try and sort out some review units and I'll give you a full in-depth analysis at a later date for a full deep review. How's it going? Yeah, it's very busy today. Uh, we had two business days and now the retail time, so it's crowded. How are you? Not too bad. Um, love your tube amplifiers. I literally just finished uh, reviewing the Euphoria Anniversary oh. Edition. Uh, not out yet, it will be out soon. Envy. Envy, that's, yeah. That's I've had a listen the to king. that with, yeah, <laughs> with Sesvaris. Um, how have people been finding this thing? What's what are your what is your message for the Envy? What was the idea behind it? Well, uh, for the first time we had uh, before Envy we had uh, the Euphoria, yes, which was our flagship, and people asked for something uh, more powerful, just to handle more uh, headphones. So yes. this is why we built it, and this is our first non OTO uh, construction. Yes. People are excited and very satisfied with what they hear, especially the match with uh, Susfara. And I agree, it's a yeah. fantastic pairing together. Yeah. Like um, Euphoria and Utopia together is yes. magic, absolutely incredible. And these two seem to be doing a very good job. Very good job. Very also good. the ZMF uh, headphones and Meze, yeah, we like yeah. it very much. Yes. So they actually, it covers all the market of, of headphones. If you've got just if you've got Sosvaras, you're good to go. You're yeah. basically you're going all the way down from Sosvara. So yes. yeah, you're definitely okay power-wise. What type of tubes um, have you guys used for the Envy? Well, it is uses uh, 300B for the power uh, yeah. tubes and 6S and 7 for driver tubes. Perfect. We put the, the CV181 from PS Vein as a standard tube. Yes. But here we show it up with uh, Aerox tubes. Yeah. So many people ask about them. Yeah, so I have just reviewed the KNHA300 Mark II with Aerox and the Sylvanias. It was yeah? lovely. Yes. Great. <laughs> Good so to hear it. next is NV to review. So very, okay. very excited. We are waiting for, for it. Very excited for that. Thank you so much. I hope Thank you have you. a fantastic show. I'll see Thank you on the you. next one. Yeah. Cheers. Hi, at Rockna. So we're with the Rockna crowd uh, in their private room. And as you can hear, I'm sure over there has been demonstrated uh, the Wave Dream line of products. And Nikolai, hi, how's it going? It's going great. I'm, I'm happy to, to, to see you, to meet you in person. We have here a limited edition of the Wave Dream. It's called the Wave Dream Anniversary, which we made especially for show. And we have also come with a new uh, Wavelight server, which is a long-awaited product from us. 
and from the other company Audio Byte we have a new uh, streamer called Superhub and uh, we are happy to see that there is much interest and uh, what we do is we want to, to, to put more smiles on people's faces because of the good sound. This is what we, what we do. So, at the IFI booth for the first time, it's, uh, they've got a massive array of their products here. Um, they weren't at CanJam London last year, so I'm kind of kind of excited to have a look at some of these new things. This one is the latest release, but I will let the gentleman tell you all about it in a moment. So, hi. Hiya. How's it going? Good, thank you. Having a good show? It's been really, really busy. Yeah, there have been lots of people uh, bringing, coming through. It's been fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, Tell yeah. me a bit about this very intricate looking design product. So this is a new iCan Phantom. Um, it's an analog amplifier uh, with an ESL uh, output stage at the bottom as well. So it has multiple outputs um, and you can use it, also use it as an analog output to an amplifier as well, as a preamp, sorry. Not oh, preamp, okay, yeah. gotcha. How much is this thing? Uh, uh, currently it's 3749. So it's uh, exceeding your previous ICANN, yes. uh, the ICANN signature, yeah? So it's like the ICANN uh, and the ESL, they, they had two separate units. Yes. And we've kind of just combined them together, together and then yeah. beefed them up a little bit, yes. Okay. Um, will the other two still remain in the lineup, like the standard ICANN, or is this going to replace that? Uh, this is going to replace that, yeah. This yes, is okay. Out. Yeah, this is the latest version. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. That's okay. So as you guys know, we've reviewed pretty much the Chord entire DAC or amp DAC combos. Um, now we're going to get into a bit more of uncharted territory for us. So this is a four two channel system, but my curiosity is how does this work with Sesvaras? How does this work with the planar hard to drive headphones? Is the noise floor low enough? Can we use it? We'll have a chat and we will see if there's a possibility of one of these for review so that we can be tested with some of these hard to drive planars. But I mean, if you look at the design of this, the machining, it's, it's something that you'll literally have on your desk and keep looking at. It kind of looks Really interesting, genuinely. And hi, how's it going? Uh, uh, it's going well. I, I'm John Franks. I'm the owner and founder of Cord Electronics. Uh, we've been going uh, 35 years now. So um, uh, it, it, we, I've seen a huge growth in the company. Uh, but I, I'm here because I'm promoting or helping to promote uh, two of our latest uh, products. Uh, one of them here. Uh, is our new integrated amplifier. Uh, it's uh, a two times uh, 130 watt amplifier, very powerful, very compact inside. Uh, fortunately, uh, during the, the COVID time, I had plenty of time to uh, design the insides of the product. Uh, and so we're, we're actually seeing um, the benefits of, of that uh, intensive time of development uh, here. So um, where is this sitting in the, it's in the coral line or above? Um, oh, th this is in a full size range, Yes. but it is uh, the smallest integrated that we've, we've made. Okay. Um, it is definitely a um, reference grade top line product, yeah. but it is uh, an, an entry level for the Ultima range. Oh, I see. Oh, that's the range in yeah, yeah, okay. Size, yes. Yeah, okay. What's the uh, kind of topology behind? Is it class A, class AB? What, what, a what did you guys go for? It's class AB. All right. But uh, it has um, a, a, a circuitry that we call Ultima, uh, Ultima topology. Right. Uh, th this was um, a topology that was originally envisaged in, in mathematical terms uh, by a professor. Um, at one of the universities in, in the UK. Um, and we, we've been able to adapt that and using his topologies. Essentially what we do is that, that there are additional error amplifiers within the circuitry, the drive circuitry of the power FETs, the very back end of the amplifier. And, and the, these are feed forward error correcting amplifiers that actually can take out any distortions that can occur actually in the final power stage 
of the amplifier itself. Okay, fantastic. And what do we have this hooked up to today here to showcase? Is it been uh, hooked up or? Being, the, hi, how's it going? New speakers. Oh, okay. But I'm not sure which they are. I think they're threes, but I, I, I don't know. But but Morris will, will probably okay. be able to. We'll tell have a look you. at that in a moment as well. Yeah. Um, this is absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. Thank it's you. It's uh, very nice brilliant. Meeting you. Likewise, yep. likewise. Yep. Yeah, absolute pleasure. You. Okay, fantastic. So, Dan Clark at their private room. Pleasure to meet you for the first time as well. Yeah, um, it's a pleasure. Likewise. Um, so I just sat down with the Voce and this lovely new one. Um, the Stealth and Expanse are on the way review-wise, but I've not sat down with those in the studio yet. They've just been at showroom floors. And to be honest with you, I'm kind of annoyed that Stealth wasn't with me to do a little bit more testing because of that close back design and the way it isolates. But for now, let's concentrate on these and first have a chat with yourself. How are you doing? Doing great. It's a pleasure. Fantastic. Likewise. So tell me a bit about what did you guys bring? What's your, what's your new release? Everything, basically. Well, Corina is our newest release, and this yeah. is uh, our flagship electrostatic headphone. Mm -hmm. And it built off the technology we developed in our Bocha using the 88mm uh, driver chassis. And the reason we picked such a very large driver was that uh, in the past, our experience with electrostats was we appreciated their transparency, but we really felt they were lacking in being able to produce the full spectrum of sound. Especially that low end, right? That bottom yeah. octave, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and in part, that's because with smaller electrostat drivers, if you don't have a perfect seal around the headphone, what happens is you'll get a sharp peak around 80 or 100 hertz with very rapid roll off. Yeah. But by making the driver so much larger, the actual weight of the air is heavier than the diaphragm. And so here, when you lose a little bit of seal, you actually get uh, a bump down more like 40 to 30 hertz, and the roll off is below 30 hertz where almost nothing has any uh, energy. So it allows us to develop uh, an electrostatic headphone that has really deep reach in the bass. Yeah. Now, what also changed between the uh, original Bocha and the Carina is that we introduced the same acoustic metamaterial technology, or AMTS, that's in our uh, stealth and expanse headphones and the simplest way to describe that is most people are familiar with the effect of standing waves in a room yes for bass you know you'll have stronger bass in the corners maybe none at all in the middle as the reflections in the room cause the waves to reinforce each other either positive uh, constructively or destructively in headphones your room is this little area inside the ear pad and so the standing waves for uh, reinforcement and reduction of energy are at higher frequencies. And so what we've done is we've introduced this metamaterial technology that allows the sound to go through it from the transducer, but then when the energy is reflected back off of your head, uh, it absorbs the high frequency reflections so that you don't create standing waves. Right. And that gives it this basically a performance that renders in a sense a little more like a loudspeaker's high frequencies but it gives you the bass performance of a headphone without the re uh, standing waves of rooms. So you've now got like the best of both worlds. It's sort of like having a, a, a perfect acoustic system without a room at all. Yeah. Uh, yet it doesn't have the sound of an anechoic chamber where everything feels like it's just dead. Exactly. Or just that high, huge resonance where it just feels like you're just being hit, bombarded by that exclusively. Yes. Uh, okay. And in, in fact, if you actually look at the measurements of this, you know, from like 200 to 7,000 hertz, there's, uh, you know, while all headphones or loudspeakers have a little bit of wobble, there's not more than about one and a quarter dB of wobble. Yeah, it's very smooth. That mid-range is it's just lush. very smooth, yeah. Um, what are we powering this one with today? We're running you... with the Malvalve uh, headphone amplifier, and this one was designed to support uh, electrostatic or conventional headphones. Gotcha, it's yeah. a cool little amp. What's the uh, voltage on the Carino? 
what? Uh, they're 580 volt oh, okay, bias. Sure. Okay, yeah. yeah. So it's compatible with the Blue Hawaii. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. I've got the Z10e coming in from mm -hmm. LTA uh, next week when I go back. I'll purchase it because I bought the X9000s. Those mm -hmm. are waiting on order. Mm -hmm. um, so at the moment, I'm reviewing the Aperio and trying to get the Shang Senior in so we can actually. I don't like echo chamber reviews. I like backups, I like comparisons uh -huh. and deep analysis. So. Um, it would be interesting if one of these could come in for review, if that is ever a possibility. To yeah, run sure. it on very high-end chains and just do some comparisons. I would like to actually sit with it in like my own environment, mm -hmm. get a proper idea of how it's performing. But yeah, that, that mid-range is actually very, very pleasant, I must admit. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to spending a little bit more time with that headphone. As, as uh, Andy from our company once said, you know, he has an April Fool's Day joke. He did a, a sieve called 64 Driver IEM because he was making a little fun of the uh, driver arms race. And somebody asked him, why did you you know, do this? You have uh, one tweeter and 64 base drivers. And his response was, who needs mid-range? <laughs> <laughs> All the fun is at the bottom and the top. Uh, for me, I can actually sacrifice a fair bit in either direction if the mid-range is just lush, beautiful, and engaging. That's where my, just basically my eardrums just congregate towards. And if there's just something wrong, it could be like a dip, it could be a little too forwardness. It's just like I come out of pleasure listening, it becomes a little bit more analytical and you're kind of a bit more looking through something in a different kind of way. I don't really enjoy that. I mean, it's fine for, to test an equipment, right? Mm -hmm. But the whole point of these equipment is so that it, the music takes you away. If it's not a tool for the music, it's pointless. It's as simple as that, really. So mid-range for me is very important, you know? Yeah, well, you know, and, and of course, the mid-range is where the vocals are, and yeah. it's where the instruments that carry the melody are. And so I've, I've always thought it was really funny that so many people kind of emphasize the top and the bottom as if like, the, the center doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. exist, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, you can get away with a sloppy bass region and stuff if you're just running around, but to be honest with you, if the mid-range is wonky, uh, for me personally, it can det completely detract me from the headphones, like a lot. And if the, obviously the treble region has got its own placement, and the, what you need is a nice balanced headphone, right? Yep. That's what, that's what it's about, so. Yeah, exactly. And you know, for me, it, it has to all play, everything is in the context of everything else. Exactly. And, you know, yeah. and, and of course the difficulty and the art and the fun of voicing headphones is you have only one transducer that has to cover the entire spectrum. Yes. And if you introduce multiple transducers, which people have done in headphones, then you recreate a lot of the problems that you have with loudspeakers, where you have the crossover. Cor that's a big and issue always, yeah. And, you know, driver blend. Um, so we find that there's, you know, because of the, uh, the fact that you have a um, closed environment with a headphone and a small amount of air to move, realistically doing the whole spectrum is possible, but Again, you have to be able to deal with the issues of reflections and standing waves. And, it's basically you're putting that driver in that room and yep. that, that needs to be... It's like a speaker, you can take a million dollar speakers into a bad room and it will still sound terrible. So, yep. it, and much cheaper speaker can sound freaking great in a fantastic room, right? So, yeah. So that's what we've tried to do. Since you have the uh, Stealth and Expanse, I gather, um, then you'll... Uh, Those I don't have. Those I've only yeah. heard. I've not heard the Expanse. I'm going to actually go and sit with it a little bit. But the Stealth, I've heard a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, the Expanse, I've not heard yet. And these two have completely eluded me up to now. But your past headphones, yes, I've heard. Obviously, the Ethers and things like that. Those mm -hmm. have been... Um, I only started reviewing, I mean, I've been in the hobby 23 years, but I only literally just started reviewing quote unquote professionally for the last two years mm -hmm. and joined the community like four years ago. So we basically started at the top end, started with Sesvaros first, and then I went through that insanity of getting Sesvaros to be driven the best way it can. And after $30,000, I gave up and I said, okay, let's try something else. <laughs> so now electrostatics is basically you wanted something even harder to drive? Mm, apparently so. And the energizers are just so infrequent, right? Um, so X9000, like I said, I've got that. So Aperio is coming. Mm -hmm. HE1 I spent like the last two days with. It's, it's time to look at the, that aspect of things. It's interesting. And once you open the door to the next category of performance, then you can actually really look at like the top end DAX and stuff. Like right now with the Aperio, I'm not leaving it as it is. Testing it with a wave dream from Rock now testing it with a May, testing it like that. So push the boundaries as much as you can. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been fascinating, I must admit. 
Yeah, it's really fun playing around with, you know, I'm, I, with gear. And if, one of the benefits of my job, of course, is I have lab equipment too. So often to see. what I'll do is I'll listen to stuff and then I'll yeah. throw it on the audio precision. And get some measurements and see. And five by five and say, yeah. did I, you know, yeah. what, what was I hearing there? And uh, oftentimes you can actually see it in the measurements now, you know, because yeah. the, the Five, That's five, a good five question. Goes down like I've got a question. Yeah. Do you think we measure? How much do you think we measure? And do you think we measure everything? Because there's so much debate about cables and about power cables and about other things. And the, in on the measurements, sometimes it shows detriment rather than kind of performance, and other times it shows nothing. And it's just like a war in our community as a rule. I'm curious on your take on that. Um, well, I do both. I, you know, I I measure and I listen yeah. um, because I am a designer. My priority is or the my methodology is i will always measure first until i'm sure that the technical fundamentals are where i need them to be like distortion time domain performance then i start tuning but i when i tune i listen and then i measure yeah um because i don't want the measurements to tell me what i'm hearing two extremes you know? on either side doesn't help really it's always yep. down the middle right you take a handful from both sides and then hopefully right. you come out with something. So decent, I start you know? I start with all measurement and no listening at all until I get to a point where it's like probably gonna be listenable and then I begin listening and measure and then measure after yeah. the listening to, to tune. And and that works out really well for me. Yeah. Um, I, I do laugh when you know people think that the measurements tell you how everything's gonna sound and I also laugh at people who don't care about measurements. Yeah. It's like, you know, I can see things that people love that are objectively garbage. You know, yeah. they are just garbage. And it's like, that may suit your taste and you may enjoy it, but objectively- It's I what is showing, right? Yeah, you yeah. know, it's like when, when I see somebody singing the praises of a product that has 5% distortion in the mid range at 94 dB, I question the validity of that person's perspective. Yeah. But, you know, if, if a product has decent fundamentals, you know, it's like, that's your view. and. Uh, your your interpretation or per, uh, perception of the music is really what matters. Yeah. But it is important to understand sometimes when things like distortion are really affecting people's perception. Uh, as a great example, you know, in that case of the 94 dB 5% distortion at mm -hmm. one kilohertz, people frequently describe that as one of the more detailed headphones. But really, what they're saying is detail is second order harmonic distortion <laughs> and if you think about it well that that is probably true because you know we often perceive detail as being the higher frequencies not the fundamentals yeah. and uh, if you elevate the higher frequencies uh, harmonics by definition you're going to then perceive more detail but it's a phantom detail that doesn't really exist so here's where kind of understanding the measurements and the listening experience can complement each other but then when you get things like how people perceive tonality and timber, well, there's a lot that goes into that, including how your individual ear is structured. And, and I was collaborating you, against what you're yeah. hearing as well. How they work together. The thing that I think bothers me a little bit is when certain aspects of a performance, like, like let's take distortion at a specific point of the frequency response, especially in treble region, it, it, they describe it as the headphones frequency response is doing this or that there's like there's like a massive peak at six kilohertz that's hurting my ears and it's actually not it's the equipment and it's the distortion that is causing that around that region but it's not the capabilities of the drivers of the headphones so in my experience what i've found is like the mismatching of quote unquote like performance levels of a specific set of drivers when I've put them on the high-end equipment that don't have these issues, when they shake off the issues of distortion, they shake off the issues of performance levels, what you find is that driver is performing to such a high standard that it's just, the, misinf the misinformation is just rampant and it's actually not very true. I'll give you an example for one like the HD800S. There is a peak around six kilohertz where we can see on the measurements, but when you throw this on ultra high-end equipment, you realize that the bass is, doesn't really, the drivers can take sub-bass, the drivers can smooth out, and most of the time, you're hearing a lot behind the drivers, and it's usually the equipment. And that's what I'm trying to separate, like pushing headphones to the highest capabilities they can to see where they are, and then we work our way backwards from that, and then work out, yes, it's the drivers, or no, it's the equipment you're using, or no, it's Synergy, or is that or the other, if that makes sense. Well, I, I put it this way, uh, I think that that does make sense. And when we 
do our tuning and our product development, we have a stack of gear, and I always do all my initial development on the best gear. Yes. And then I start checking and validating on the lesser gear. Yes. And, uh, you know, sometimes what that just tells me is this lesser gear is not going to work with this product. Yeah. You know, there are plenty of times when an amplifier, for instance, just, you know, a, 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 an amplifier that's going to really ease, have an easy time with our planers is one that, you know, when you look at the power rating at 64 ohms, the power doubles to 32 ohms, and it doubles again at 16 ohms. Yeah. Uh, companies like Cord Audio design their headphone amplifiers to support down to 8 ohms with current doubling. Yeah. So you pretty much know that, you know, like one of those pieces of product is going to support anything you do at any impedance. Yes. It will just be well behaved as, as well behaved at and consistent, 12 ohms basically, as it yeah. is at 150. Um, then we come across products where it behaves flawlessly down to like 100 ohms and below that it performs really poorly. Yeah. And, you know, those are amplifiers that were clearly designed with dynamic headphones in mind and aren't just aren't going to work with planners. Panels, yeah. And so, you know, that's some of the ones where measurements will make it really obvious when, you know, the manufacturer's specs don't. Yes. Okay. It's been fascinating. Thank you so much for this chat. I think we might yeah. actually have to separate this, uh, like show the beginning of this and just do a full on video in our, I'll put it into our like fireside chat series and put it as a like a proper video by itself. I really do appreciate it. Oh sure. I'm gonna it's have fun. a listen to the expanse as well. Thank yep. you so much. Um, it's been wonderful. All right, mister, what's going on? What's good? How's it going? All right, so what are we discussing? We're just going to walk and talk. Where we, well, we should walk the right direction. We should walk the right direction towards the show. Just just natural, you know? Laugh? Just chat shit. Yeah, yeah. All right. Just chat shit. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to walk with you, sir. Well, right, yeah. that was, He's going to be filming. Okay. You know, if you if you were luckier, you could be Mr. Magoo, but you fell off the scooter yesterday. So, <laughs> but okay. So HE1, we could just talk about that because you finally got to hear it. Yeah. The, the, the Orpheus, the new Orpheus. It's still yeah. the best headphone. I think so. Uh, I think hardware, I, and so, uh, hardware and sound together it is the best. I mean, it's probably one of the better experiences exp just because yeah. of the, like, the way it works. But you know, you know, I have a problem with Sennheiser because of them. Because does Sennheiser make a planar? No. Does Sennheiser make an electrostat? Only one. Obviously, they've chosen it as the best medium for sound. And then they don't make another version of There's it. There's no entry point. There's, There's no the, entry point it's like, for anybody. Yeah, it's like making cars and cars and cars and realizing you're top of the line, nah, it's a boat. It's just one of those, like, I wish they would, if you're gonna sell me, sell me the HE1, I know it has to be the best, but sell me like a $5,000 electrostat, just an electrostat. That Basically I a Shang Junior, just so that you get like that entry point or something. Something. But I think that Jeez, was the, the, right? the- Put your uh, money where your mouth is. Yeah. The engineer was saying that the whole point of the HE1 was that there was no price to performance ratio. It was just basically go for the best we can actually achieve, you know? Do you, do you think there'll be a new one in the next five years? HE1? No, I think there will be more of their dynamic stuff. I honestly don't think HE1 is going to get touched. In uh, a I would like to time. see them attempt to make something as impressive as that and use either a dynamic or a comedy or something new. I feel like they're the ones that now that they sold their consumer division, it probably won't be as likely. But I feel like they could probably beat that if they put their minds to it. You know, Z, the thing is, um, at the moment, over the last couple of years, no, actually, even last year, I've seen that uh, Sennheiser kind of releasing the HE1 into the wild a little bit more than they used to. I mean, they're, li they're literally, I don't know if it's because we're at Munich and I've never been here before, but it's just sitting. It's just sitting there. And they're not saying anything. And you can play anything you want. You can yes. turn the volume up as high that as you want. That is not usual. No, it's usually you have to book an appointment and someone has to literally show up and monitor you. This is like, eh, whatever. Yeah, whatever. It's just there if you want it. Yeah, Honestly, if you want it, you want it, 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 it was literally the waiting room for the ear scans. Yeah. They're like, yeah, have a seat back here and, you know, fuck around. Read a magazine or I literally listen picked to the it up. world's greatest I, I headphone. I literally just picked it up. There was no one there. So she said, you, oh, you know picked, what you're doing. You should have picked just... it up and seen how far you got. <laughs> it might have been a fun little thought experiment. Yeah, the, Warwick was trying to get actually take it off of the table and bring it into Aperio so we can do a side-by-side -side comparison. Oh. But I, th I think they might have said no because I didn't hear anything <laughs> I think back, you probably you have know? better luck bringing the Warwick stuff out. I mean, let me just see how it fits on the desk in my hotel. In my hotel, exactly. <laughs> I don't think, I don't think that was going to work. So backpack worthy.
But yeah, now this. But, um, I must admit, like it's design, the marble design, the way it opens up. That they, they've nailed that. I they've mean, nailed the experience of actually. The unboxing down. experience on most headphones is terrible. So this is an unboxing experience, literally every time you turn it off. Yes, it really is. Yeah. So yeah, it's um, fun. And the rest of the show, as far as like, you haven't heard speakers yet. You're doing no, that no, tomorrow. We oh, uh, I went to the Rockner room because I went and had a chat to a Nikolai. Um, it was nice, but. For impressive hardware looks, it was the cord room with their new integrated and their three, I think it's the three. You and I differ greatly because I hate the cord stuff. Really? It's just so over the top. It's like trying to be Buck Rogers. And I... it's like, I get it. They have good hardware, but I feel like it's good hardware and design just to charge you more. Like if they made it simple, if they just made it a circuit board in a metal box, it would be five thousand dollars less. Oh, oh, without a doubt, ten thousand dollars less for some of the but, things. But I just think, it's just like a, another black box on your table, it's just. I mean, I, I was stopping and looking at equipment that I thought looked nice, and then I went into a room and they didn't have the speakers set up correctly, and it sounded like ass. I was like, oh, no. When it comes to speakers, the room is key. The room. I mean, you can have a million pair, million dollar pair of speakers in a bad room, and it's still gonna sound shit. I, I was actually the glass speakers, the speakers that have not the ones that are made of glass, the ones that have the drivers turned yeah. in glass. I was actually really impressed with them, mostly because the room is untreated, and they corner loaded them. That's really And it was bizarre. still like there was some room, room. I could tell the room nodes were there, but it was performing well enough that I was like impressed, despite that. Okay. But yeah, no, and you have to get to the glass room. We'll do that on Audio Quest room as well. Everybody... I have, everyone's talking about the Audio Quest room and I haven't been there yet, yeah. so I'm probably gonna hit that up soon. I gotta go get to uh, Klipsch and Triangle because they sponsored this video, thank you. Well, they didn't sponsor this video, they sponsored my videos. And yo, Warwick, thank you for setting up literally Thursday and Friday, absolute legends. It was honestly the difference it made for filming on those two days versus today yeah, is no, just night it, and day. It was required, like I came here and I'm sort of calm and I don't have to worry about waiting in line for most of these things. So we're gonna see what we're doing. I gotta go head out now, guys. All right, mate. Take so it easy. So you enjoy the rest of the show. I'm, I'll probably catch up with you a little bit later, or maybe tomorrow. And nice. uh, don't forget to listen to Cabas. Nice. The Rialto, uh, king of speakers. So. In this private room with Hi Feynman, this is the Shang Senior. Currently, it's been tested with the Shang Junior amplifier, which I've not heard. I tried the Senior amplifier back at London. Um, as I think we've stated many, many times in our comments and stuff, that the Shang Senior really does change with what system is behind it. And this seems to be the case for the X9000 as well. I'm finding the same scenario with the Aperio, even taking the system out of its environment and adding another DAC to the situation really changes the game. So the Shang Senior, take it with a pinch of salt, obviously it's on the junior energizer and the environment's pretty good here, it's pretty silent. So what I have found with this electrostatic versus some of the other top of the line ones is its height in stage, its presentation, changes a lot with the energizer behind it so right now you've got more of an intimate stage and yet you've got the elevation of the actual instruments and the layering of the track in height form more than the others it's definitely comparable to the he1 and aperio but i think these three systems all give their own characteristics and i think they're all going to try and one up each other it'd be good to have them side by side to actually get a full in-depth analysis of what's happening but the resolution is out of this world it's so transparent. It's like looking through a liquid clean glass. It's kind of insane. So with that, I'm going to say hi to you and Hello. tell us a bit about the history of this headphone and what your, what the philosophy is behind it, kind of like. Okay, well, way back in the day, um, long before I was anything to do with hi Man, um, Fang created an electrostatic called the Jade. Um, it's a deal we just talked about. We're going to have a listen well, to that as well. Well, 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 we have the Jade 2 now. Right. So the Jade was the original one, and it was, you know, it was, um, should we say it was a little maybe DIY? Okay. You know, this is good, you know, back in the very early days. Yeah. And of course, then, you know, he moved into planers, but he always kind of wanted to kind of do something with electrostatics because, you know, they, they can do just so much more. 
than a planer. I mean, you you know, it's, lots it's of so experience. light. The the driver. The, oh yeah, it's so with light. no magnets. I mean, yeah. they weigh nothing. Yeah, it's actually it's a little disturbing when you first pick them up because you expect it to be heavy. I think these are the most comfortable electrostatics I've tried up to now, mm. without a doubt. It's it's it just doesn't weigh. It's like an Aria, but I think lighter. Oh yeah, genuinely, well, yeah, it's lighter because, than Aria. Because there's no because magnets. magnets yeah. There's no magnets, and so you know, it's it's actually it's weird. It's like you pick them up and it's like it's hollow. There's nothing in I it. completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but yeah, so he you know, plain planers are a lot easier to work with. Electrostatics are hard to work with, you know, the the high voltages, um, trying to get, you know, a good bass response out of yes. electrostatics hard. It's very hard, yeah. So it was it was one of these kind of like projects that you know Fang tinkered around with for years and years and you know, and his dream was basically to create the best that he was possible to bake. Yes. You know, kind of screw everything else, screw practicality, screw cost, just what's the Let's most what's possible. spectacular Let's thing he can make. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you've seen in the past, you know, there were many various um, prototypes, especially for the amp. Oh no, definitely that not. That were weird yeah. looking, nothing like the one that, that eventually went into production. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, he played around with it. it basically so was, basically, you know, was there was an evolution. Project. There was an evolution behind it, right? So Yeah, it was, yeah. It, you know, it was his sort of project side hobby right. thing. You know, the, 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 the business was the planar stuff. You know, the, 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 the Shangri-La prep was, was what he did for fun. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, worked on it for years and years and years and years, and eventually, you know, got it kind of fine-tuned, honed to the way he wanted it to be, and then, you know, the result you have in your hand. Yeah. Um, can't wait to it's, actually... It's, it's pretty spectacular. I can't wait to actually get this in for review. Uh, with, we'll try and see if a possibility exists, because we want to put these up against each other and have a listen to everything, to see what everything's providing. And obviously, um, have a listen to this in its own environment. Of it. I mean, yeah, a, I this mean, is a very it, nice setup to this. It's not bad it's at not all. Perfect. It's still not home environment. Yeah, no, it's not no. home environment. It's not your own music. It's not your own DAX and stuff like that. You just, things you know, you know? Well, exactly, exactly. When you come in and you're listening to three things you've not heard of before, you have no idea which is what, yeah. playing which part. Definitely. But thank you so much, I appreciate it. Um, I can't wait to get more time with this. Nice to meet you again and nice, nice to, to see, see you again. again. Good to how see is, you again. <laughs> how has it been? It's been absolutely bedlam here, so oh, busy. Yeah. Oh yeah, very busy, very good show. <laughs> what very did you guys bring? Uh, we brought everything from our lineup, from the 99 Classics to the 109 Pro, the recent launch, the new color scheme for the Lee Tungsten, and also outside we have our full line of IEMs, yes. uh, paired with the newly launched GoPod from iFi. That's a new bundle that we're... Putting together, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've not tried any of the IEMs from Meza yet, so I think that's going to be the next line of reviews oh, to definitely do. Definitely, definitely, yeah. <laughs> so, the Elite, for those of you who are new to these lines of headphones, this is the Isodynamic Hybrid Array driver in this, in conjunction with Meza Audio. The planar, but the way this distributes the weight, honestly, it's absolutely freaking insane. So if you've not tried it, definitely go and try one of these headphones. Normally when we look at some of the other um, line of planar headphones, they're so heavy that long wearing becomes an issue. But I always fight between this and Sasvara for what's the most comfortable headphone, but look at the design of this. It's a work of art. So. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and we'll have a chat to Antonio himself tomorrow. Yes. And uh, yeah. The man that, himself. Yes. <laughs> oh, and this is their flagship cables. These are, look at this. <laughs> Stunning. <laughs>
we learned a lot. So when we launched the 99 Classics, which is what kind of propelled us in the hyper world, and then the Imperian, we were a totally different level than we are today in terms of experience, knowledge, understanding of the, the whole hi-fi environment. So it's very exciting for me and my team the fact that we have a lot of stuff on the table right now, projects lined up, we think it's going to be really interesting products. Anything you can talk about? Anything you can oh, give a hint about? Headphones for sure. <laughs> <laughs> like the, the, the release of the 109 Pro yeah. was absolutely phenomenal. That was all in-house, in-house drivers, uh, the right? The driver is designed in-house and, then and engineered in-house, but the parts are not made in-house. Okay. So the, the headphone is assembled in-house. Yes. I, I realized that in the media there was some uh, misunderstanding and then it, it propagated, but we never... So let's yeah. correct that. Yeah, yes. so the driver in the 109 is not manufactured in-house. It's not the... Uh, Renaro ISO high, it's not the Renaro one, no, right? No, no, no. Okay. it has nothing to do. They do the planars, okay. and that's made by Renaro, assembled in Ukraine, designed, assembled, everything engineered in Ukraine. And then the 109 has a dynamic driver, so it's a totally different uh, architecture and different, different uh, source of parts. And uh, based on this chassis, let's say this, this platform, we are now developing further models. I'm very glad to hear that. The tuning of Lyric stepped outside of the Meze sort of sound, and then with 109 Pro, I love this direction that Meze is taking. It's, uh, 109 Pro has been absolutely fantastic. I gave it the king under $1,000, so it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, we, we really, um, I would say, our understanding of what, how psychoacoustics works, and also our understanding of how to tune headphones has really improved and the 109 is basically the result of our, our level of understanding of two years ago and one year ago when we were developing and tuning it. So, so we did always our best. Knowledge comes with time, right? But knowledge comes with time and, and uh, we did get uh, some praise for design and comfort and uh, some people were not so happy sometimes with certain tunings. Yeah. You know, the, the truth is that we are a very young manufacturer and I think because the 99 Classics was quite hyped for these last few years and it was quite in the eye of the hi-fi public, so the scrutiny was very strong and I perfectly understand it. I just really hope that the public understands that we always did to the best of our capacity. Yes. Because there's often this kind of attitude of the public or sometimes even the media where they imply that there's a certain malevolence on the part of manufacturers, but in every single manufacturer is trying to do their best. There's engineers behind every piece of work, so there's you have always, to, you know, Yeah, so. there's always somebody's best in anything, so, you know, I think it's the intention that counts yes. and the openness of, of the designers, engineers, and the people running this, all these small, amazing businesses. And we have to recognize that uh, there's a lot of and there's personal emotion and a lot of blood, sweat and tear in every single brand. So I really hope that in general the world will be a bit more understanding because of small brands. I, I sense, and I want to kind of advocate for this, I sense that the public sometimes it's even more harsh with smaller manufacturers than they are with the big companies, while the resources of small manufacturers you can imagine are smaller and the personal implication is much bigger. It's like you know somebody's name on the product, or uh, you know one person responsible for the whole design and development and prototyping and testing in, in some small company. So I think this is a, the special and amazing difference that this show is about. That here it's a lot about personal investment and a lot of uh, emotion and uh, craftsmanship and passion. So it's, it's different than, you know, when you go to a big CS or IFA show where people are more like employees and they're hired guns in all the different levels. So. And there's always an audience for the right product. There Not is, everything, yeah. you know, that is, is one message that actually does get convoluted a lot yes. and miss, yes. uh, miss yes. there will always be something for something, yes. so. Exactly, and, and we get that because we, we listen to the uh, feedback from our partners, our, our retailers and our public, and we are trying always to find like, okay, what is the sweet spot and trying to get to that sweet spot. Yes. But at the same time, there's always some who uh, have a different preference. And sometimes 
quite often they have quite strong opinion and strong voice. And this creates, um, how do you say, the opposite of correlation. Mis mi misunderstanding. Mi yeah, misunderstanding or um, basically the reality of what most people want is not so obvious in online forums or discussions. Oh, of course not. Because Audio is so subjective are, as well, right? So. And the people who are usually happy, they just use the product. And then there's people who just like to maybe point out things that they're not happy with. And then that's very, very vocal. So in, in the end, often there's products which have the wrong uh, image. I'm, I'm talking about any product in Hi-Fi. No, I'm not talking about us. Yeah. The, the talk about them in the media is actually not in correlation with how the public buys it and uses it and is happy or not with it. So it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon to observe for me after all these years. I mean, if somebody's happy with a the product, they're not, most of the time they don't really think about it. They don't advertise it. They don't yeah. talk about it, right? So, but if there's something wrong, they, people like to yeah. yell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so there's this uh, bias of, uh, of uh, reviews that uh, you have to be uh, Pay you have attention to step outside because of yourself. Then if you're the new guy and you come into, a, let's say, you, you become passionate about hi-fi or portable hi-fi or whatever, and then you read reviews. And then the reviews actually don't reflect the real proportion of you know, what's right and wrong about different product categories. So th These are the thoughts that, that's been in my head lately because uh, I'm, I'm looking at the hi-fi industry as a whole and we're observing more and more what's, what's going on, what's the, you know, the momentum and the the vibe yeah. and it's it's quite complex it's not it's not so straight and forward it's not black and white it's and audio being so subjective it's uh, yeah, yeah it, they, they've it always been it only complicates uh, yeah. the discussion the right? exactly. yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you so much for this chat I appreciate it thank you very much Absolute for coming pleasure. by hi how's hi. it going Hi, it's good. Yeah, I used to know you on Facebook and we are a friend already. Oh, thank you so yeah. much. Yes, and we saw each other in London Paul, as well. Yeah, Paul from Let's Shore and uh, yes, my, my colleague used to visit, uh, you know, know you on in Kajam London. Yes, yeah. nice to meet you. Likewise, what have you guys bought for us today? Yeah, we have some, you know, the common things we have is our from the 100 US dollar, uh, let's show product, uh, IM product from 2000, more than 2000 US dollar, you know, Condenser 12 is our flagship. Oh, and really? The full range, yes. <laughs> and we also have a prototype would like you all to test. Yeah, it's a new full dynamic driver earphone. Okay. Yeah, and it uh, has our own dynamic driver, let's show our own brand. Yeah, so maybe you can maybe you can have a try. Yes, that's what we got. Yeah, that's what we got today. Okay, fantastic. Can I try your flagship IEMs first? Of course. Thank you. This is the band. You would like the balance band or the three point five or balance for uh, balance, please. Balance. Yeah. Okay. So this is a uh, you know replaceable socket. Really? Yes. It's, oh, okay, attached. Fantastic. Yes. That is fantastic. Yeah. Yes. So for flagship, it's not so so many of them, but still, it's easier easier for people to get more choice. Yes. Yes. Uh, this this is the four point four. Thank you so much. And which kind of ear tip you would like? You have your own, or we have the more medium. Sil oh, medium silicon, please. Yeah. Okay. Please, then for first, I will help you to. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's fine. That's fantastic. Yeah. Okay. How many drivers is in this one? Yeah, one Dynamic plus 11 BAs. Oh, okay. Yes, totally 12 by side. Yeah. Excellent. Oh, I'm excited to hear this one. Yeah, a little heavy, but you will not feel it on your ear. Yeah. So, these uh, ergonomically fit very in the ear very nicely. Isolation is pretty decent in a noisy environment like this. Obviously, take the sound signature with a grain of salt. Uh, I'm just using a dongle at the moment, and obviously tips and stuff like that will play a massive role. But it's very engaging in the mid-range. It's neutral with a tiniest of sparkle up top, but quite authoritative and very dense and meaty sounding. Rich vocals, um, definitely worth exploring. I think this might be a winner. I just need to actually get more tips. Maybe an open bore one. Uh, the bore on this, it's not really wide and it's not really narrow, so you can actually experiment with quite a variety of tips. Very good strong start and the cable's very decent as well. Tiny bit stiff, but doesn't seem to keep its shape. Braided, yeah. 
This is excellent. Very, very good stuff. Fantastic. Yeah. Hope our colleague can send you a sample for Oh, I hope so. I'll, be, I'll love to review it. That's fantastic. Um, yeah. I'll yeah. send it to you next week. Excellent. Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, have fun, and I will see you guys, and I can't wait to review this. It's okay. going to be brilliant. So, we're at the firm table. Hi, absolute pleasure to meet Matthew you for the Hamela. first time. So, uh, please talk to us about this new deck you guys have just launched. Okay, my name is Martin Hamela. I'm the owner of the company called HEM, which is the owner of the brand Ferrum Audio. And we manufacture right now four units. One is power supply, um, the other uh, headphone amplifier, headphone amplifier combined with uh, DAC, plus the newest product, which is the um, uh, standalone DAC. Standalone DAC. When we started designing this product, we decided that we want to have something which is, you know, in our company, we like, you know, products we do um, less but better. We are not big fans of Swiss knives. So basically, we, we designed a product which does one function very, very well. Very well, not a jack of all trades. Yeah, this is the reason why there is no inside the phono preamplifier or, you know, the, the headphone amplifier, nothing like that. It does conversion very well. Plus, it's kind of universal because you, you can use it in headphone systems or you can use them in a uh, two channel, uh, channel speaker, speaker system. That's, that's, and you can even connect uh, to this unit uh, your TV. So it can be really hard of your uh, home system. So you can, it's got HDMI arc on the back, which yeah. is very rare, if at all, which is fantastic. Yeah, so yeah, for those of people who like gaming and you want a good DAC, going through a TV, we, we had, you know, three attempts to do it, really, three times. We, we started three times. And the first time, you know, uh, we somehow we defined the unit, but we weren't glad, you know, of the results we got. Yes. I mean, in overall, all was fine, but, you know, but, but again, the unit like wasn't... The drawing board, basically. Yeah, yeah, with the second attempt, it was more or less the same. However, you know, the unit was, uh, I mean, you know, in a perfect form as from the um, functional point of view. But it lacked, you know, the soul. It lacked, you know, the, um, uh, this thing which, which, which makes the duck the very good, okay? It was just average. So, so basically, we started thinking what to do because we just didn't want to, to, to launch an average product. We, yeah. we wanted to have the very good product. We have pinpointed two, two things which could be improved. One was, you know, the filter section. Because you know when you when you design uh, ducks, uh, you usually take uh, take the duck chip and everything's inside, right? So like like filters, uh, uh, FIR, IR, yeah. and then you know and and so on. And then on the end there's modulator. What we did, uh, we decided you know to to move um, the filters from the ASS chip to uh, out of, of this and and to, to to make filters by ourselves in our powerful sensor module. Okay. So that's uh, and and this that was only possible because we had we have this right now this 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 uh, digital engine called Serce. Serce in Polish is, is hard, okay? okay? So so it contains everything and it had enough um, computing power to make possible implementation of the filters in our unit. Okay. So that was first thing. And then, but you know, I felt like we were talking, we usually we have the conversation during the lunch in our kitchen and it was like Max was, you know, um, uh, our leading uh, hardware designer. I asked me, um, Max, what do you think? Can we do anything about the IV section? Because, you know, I always felt like, you know, we never analyzed really um, what can be improved in, in you know in IV section? We were pretty straightforward with this, yeah. and and Max started thinking a few days later. You know, came and say, say, Martin, I have several ideas. I would like to test them. So I, I told him, go for this, and you know, we test them. So you, it's you know, it's like the process. So so he he took the the, the clear the clear sheets of paper. He drew you know the schematics, then put them to computer to simulation. He simulated everything. He chose, you know, the proper circuits. We built, we, we built seven prototypes, seven versions. We tested them, and funny part is that they uh, all measured very, very well. But then, when we started the listing session, uh, it appeared that um, that only one version was very good. It's it's very elegant solution, very simple, but that's like you know every uh, good design. You know, bad designs do not look good. It's always like that. You look at them and you know there's bad design. Yeah. Because you know when this, uh, it's kinda you know this thumb roll. When you, when you see the design, it's made elegant, 
it's made, you know, it's visible immediately. Yeah. Visible that it should work okay. Sometimes we are not working okay, okay, because there are fundamental mistakes in the design. It's true. But at the same time, you always have this feeling which is obviously mostly pretty cool. So that, that this, this circle is elegant, it's wonderful. And it determines the sound signature of our dance. Fantastic. These headphones, Plena, Binom ER, but let me hand it off to the designer. Hi, how's it going? Thank you, I'm fine. How has Munich been for you? How has the high-end show been for you? Oh, <laughs> too many people here. <laughs> yeah? Yes. How is the reception for these headphones? I've been listening for the last 25 minutes here. And? Your opinion? I want to buy one. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> You can get it there, of course. It's not Always. that I want to test it, have a review it, I want to listen to it. No, I want to buy one. <laughs> That's a really it is possible. Always possible. Always For you, possible. Especially. Bring, us, like, bring us the money, we'll give you the headphones, right? <laughs> of course. Of course. Um, talk to us a bit about these planar headphones. They're very light, by the way, and very comfortable. Yes, the main idea was to do the headphones super high-end, of yes. course, for very high level. And uh, we don't forget this headphones as mobile device. So here is use the Type-C connector on both sides. It means you can use the Y cable. For example, you can connect it with this cable, stationary one on both sides, or you can use the mobile cable and connect it each side you want. Okay. So you can get, uh, get you with, with you and listen to music Overall. My impressions of these, they are so open. It's like real, realistic, smooth, ultra smooth. And obviously you can change the pads, that's, uh, and they really do change with pads up. So, so it's like the ZMF sort of design where you fold the pads uh, over the coupling driver and it just sits there, basically. And ultra comfortable binds around glasses very well because they're very deep but the level of resolution tonality is kind of breathtaking i genuinely mean this it's not just that i want to review this i want to own this and i've only listened for 25 minutes this is something special So, Jamie, the trip to Munich High End. Exhausting, absolutely incredible. But to conclude the entire event, the thing to take away from this was that Munich High End is so big, it's almost impossible seeing everything that is on show. I think we did a good dent in regards to headphone-related products. But even that was like 2% of the stuff that was there. It's almost impossible literally walking around. I think we might have exceeded a good 100, 150,000 steps over the last four days. It's a can jam times 100. And the main concentration on Munich High End has been the speakers. The Kabas, for the first time in like 20 years, I want to replace my studio monitors. They were absolutely incredible. The boys and girls over at Meze, IFI, Odyssey, Spirit Torino, and I am truly sorry if I miss anybody out because the list is endless. It was so accommodating, so lovely. Um, wonderful seeing some of you viewers and getting together with our other buddies in the YouTube game. The special event Martin set up from Warwick Acoustics. You are an absolute legend, HE1 and a Perio in a quiet room to have a listen to and compare. It was absolutely legendary. I'm tired, I'm exhausted, but I am so glad I came here, genuinely. 
I think some of the highlights and standouts in regards to equipment for me was definitely those Kabas speakers from the speaker side of things. From headphone side of things, Spirit Torino's new planar headphone was very interesting. The Furum DAC is intriguing. The Astellon Kern SE300 ladder DAC was very exciting. And I've got a couple of headphones from the signature line from a German company starting literally $169 all the way up to $999 were absolutely fantastic. So reviews on those stuff will be coming. I had a chat to the Felix Audio boys in regards to the Envy. If this stuff works out and everything comes in for review, we are packed up to the gills for the next two years. In conclusion, Munich High End, I'm definitely gonna be here next year. It was absolutely legendary. And the exhibitor pass that Work Acoustics set up for us allowed us to give you guys a full film, not even a documentary, on the high-end show that I hope you guys have enjoyed. I hope it's something that you have not seen before done like this, in this manner and in so much depth. Until the next one, I'm gonna go and finish my drink.